this will be good for now, I guess. So, well, for the people who are here, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Is that all right, Dale? Yep, absolutely. All right, well, you welcome you to uh, the virtual Freethinkers Corner Books and More. My name's Chris, and I'm the proprietor, and we're in Dover, New Hampshire, 652 Central Ave. And um, this is our first Zoom event. This is a great program, though. We did do this live last year. Um, all but uh, Coralie's um, books are available in our store. I will have hers very soon. After this, I'll put together a quick order and shoot that out to her, so I'll have her books soon. All the books are um, available on our website, freethinkerscorner.com. You can purchase them that way. You can also purchase them, you know, come into the store and get them. You can also go to bookshop.org. We have a link on our website for that. If you wish to purchase it that way, we do get a portion of sales from that as well. So I'd like to go ahead and uh, plug that. And um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dale and uh, to make all the introductions and, and the program. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to the Sisters in Crime for setting up this mystery-making panel. We hope to have some fun today, and thank you all for attending in your various homes to see how the sausage is made. You know, huh. they say you shouldn't, you shouldn't watch it, but for a mystery, it's a lot of fun being part of the process to, to put on all these different clues and, and watch these, these fine minds at work putting these things together to make a fun mystery. I mean, this is, this is the good part. The hard part is just sitting down and writing it all. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. The ideas are the fun part. I, so uh, we'll start uh, with every author introducing themselves. First of all, I'm your moderator, Dale T. Phillips. And my latest mystery is Neptune City, Ooh. a short, quick, fun mystery. And uh, my tagline is scary books and murderous crooks. Now, uh, first, oh. Somebody went away. We're Coralie. Okay, there she goes. Chris took himself off, too. Okay. So, Coralie, why don't you get us started and tell us who you are, okay. what you write, and how your process works sometime in brief. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm Coralie Hughes-Jensen. I write contemporary and historical mysteries, mostly, sometimes other things. Uh, I started writing so I could travel. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not kind of the opposite. Uh, I Tax used to break. <laughs> I used to read Leon Uris, and he always did that. He went and lived in other places and then wrote about the places. So I decided I was going to do that. So all my books are in different places. So that's what my thing is. My latest book is Legs to Die For. It disappears. And uh, it takes place in Denmark, an American boy that is a problem child goes to Denmark to be with his grandfather after his parents are killed. And he's a troublemaker, but they sort of, the life there and life as a detective there, it straightens him out. So that's it. Excellent. Thank you. Maureen, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm coming to you today from another Dover, Dover Foxcroft. Uh, Maine, where even I, further up, <laughs> not where I do not live. I'm on a writing vacation because um, I'm trying to write a book that takes place up here, and I find that if you go to the place where the book takes place, it really helps the process. Maybe we can talk more about that later. But I'm also the author of the Bernie O'Day mystery series, and is that backwards? No, or no, that's fine. Nice. I love that. Ooh. Very nice. <laughs> Extreme right. close-up. <laughs> Which takes place in Franklin County, Maine, a couple counties over, like, you, um, yeah. uh, my New Hampshire connection, because I Chris's awesome bookstores in New Hampshire, is I worked for the New Hampshire Union Leader for 25 years, and my books, my mysteries are um, newspaper-based in a way, and a lot of the ideas um, for my plots, and also for people, particularly ones I don't like, um, come from my lengthy newspaper career. <laughs> Excellent. And, Thank you. And also, they're, I should say, they're, they're traditional amateur sleuth ah. that series. Is. The one I'm writing now is kind of turning into um, a domestic suspense more than a whodunit. Excellent. I think uh, most of our attendees are familiar with the different genres of mystery, but for those who aren't, there's different types depending. And some of the, the cues and clues that you're going to give the panel will determine the type of mystery they're going to put together. So, Linda, I guess you're up next. 
And I see where we have your latest book. Wow. Yes. Um, I, had to, I had to share a virtual copy because mine is somewhere between the printer and my house. Uh, this is my second uh, mystery series. Uh, I write both uh, mystery and romance, but almost all of my books have been set during World War II. I'm very, very fascinated with the 1940s and World War II specifically. My first series, um, they're, both series are traditional whodunit, amateur sleuth. Uh, the first series was set in England. This is a series that's set on the home front. And as you can see, this one takes place at Madison Square Garden. And where I got the idea for this one, I grew up in New Jersey and very often went into the city with both my family and um, school field trips and that sort of thing, and often ended up at Madison Square Garden for a variety of different uh, events. And I was rummaging around, I'm a huge research geek. I will <laughs> research oh, yeah. till the cows come home. And I stumbled on a fact that uh, aviator Charles Lindbergh was against the US entering the war. And he actually was part of an organization called America First. And he went all over the country holding rallies to try and kind of get everybody behind him saying, no, we shouldn't be in the war. We shouldn't be in the war. And so I came up with the idea of um, an attempted assassination attempt. And uh, the young woman who wrestles the shooter to the ground ends up holding the gun. So the cops think she did it and she has to prove her innocence. That's all I Excellent. Now, I believe there was a large Nazi rally at Madison Square Garden in the 1930s, too. About 20,000 Americans went yeah. in support of the Nazi party at Madison Square Garden. That is correct. That is absolutely yeah. correct. Yeah. So the more things change, the more they stay the same, unfortunately. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so audience, now what we'd like you to do is come up first. We're going to come up with some character names, and we're going to think about people as uh, the sleuth, uh, or the protagonist. Uh, we're going to think about people as villains, maybe as victims, and uh, people who stand by the other people, including red herrings, people that might be involved or might not. You're not really sure. And then later we're going to give them occupations, and we're going to go through some things like settings, because setting is very important. I think all of us uh, New England writers are very keen on making the setting a very big part of the story. We're going to need weapons, we're going to need motivations, and you're going to put the mystery together. And what I'll ask you to do is on cue, we have a chat bar, so when you come up with an idea, please enter it in the chat bar, and we will read those off and see uh, which of the authors would like to take a ball and run with it. Right, and can I add, Dale, not, to, um, not to step on your stuff, but we're just looking for names. First and of all. Authors, for... Right, and then the authors will wrangle over which names are good for the detective and which one or sleuth and which ones are good for the victim and argue about it and stuff or yes so uh audience first uh please uh give us your name ideas in the uh, chat room and we'll see what we can come up with and it could be right in the chat, you'll find at the bottom um if you toggle down to the bottom of the screen they can be Jane Austen sounding names. They can be action names like Jack Reacher. They can be anything. So. And while we're waiting for some names, I um I too I want to just say because we're talking about process a little. One thing I do and one thing I've been able to do while I've been up here in Dover or Foxcroft is um I like to go to cemeteries that are in the place where my book takes place um and so I can get a feel for the last names. And it's really hard when you're writing a book sometimes to come up with good names. Um, and so that's kind of a tip um, for people to come up with names. And you like to walk in them. Yes, I do. <laughs> I do lots of steps. Actually, I've used, I've used cemeteries too. Um, I have a collection of yearbooks from the 1940s that I use. Okay, Susan's oh, got a question good. for us. What names do you really like that will give the listeners an idea of what you're looking for? Well, the way this usually works is you, it, usually we have people write them down and put them in a bag and we pull names out of bags. So we're just looking for you guys to just list names that, um, that you are, you know. Well, think would make interesting characters. Right. Yeah, although it doesn't have to be, it can be just a first name or just a last name. One of the ones I attended 
somebody just came up with a first name and somebody else jumped on board and managed to come up with a last name that everybody thought was fun. So yeah. somebody came up with Rocky the dog at one of these. And I wrote a whole story about the character named Rocky the dog, even though their idea was their dog named Rocky. I turned it into a, a hood who was doing business in the neighborhood. So we never know where these things are going to go. And I, I know the pressure's on since there's only Chris and uh, two viewers, but you guys are writers. You can think of some names. Yes, I think you're up to the task. Okay, so if we have nobody coming on yet, how about Barton Westbury? See yeah. if anybody can do something with that. Barton Westbury? Barton yeah, or Barton Barton Westbury? Oh, is it Barton? Barton okay. or Barton, whatever you... I like Barton, and that sounds like a... Oh, Sharon. Oh, Here we oh, go. Oh, Sharon's got some. Awesome. Excellent. Velvet Banning. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> There's a mystery name right there. Right. And Dr. I can already Dr. See Lawrence. Good. I think yeah. we can, you can make the chat um, visible. Bang. Chips. And I think everybody can see that, right? Well, Chips. if they click on chat at the you, bottom of their screen. Chat, um, Chips Saunders. Yeah. Howard Green Mudge. And we got Velvet Bannon. Yep. Oh, that was Walter, a mistake. I think we have a Walter coming in. Yes. <laughs> oh, I thought she was thirsty. <laughs> I know. Water, I thought, water, I thought water, I water. I was to cry for help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah after, after a couple hours of writing, we're like, you know, getting parched. Okay, so can anybody... Uh, now I can't get it on there. <laughs> anybody like to run with a Velvet Banning, Dr. Lawrence Ming, Chip Saunders, or Howard Greenmudge? Or Walter Wickham. See, to me, Velvet Banning is totally noir. With and combined with Barton Westbury, I I could do I could run with those with historicals, but uh, okay, you know, like a noir. Yeah, it looks like we're going noir here. And Ken, that's the that's the great thing about the mysteries is that certain names and the other elements suggest the type of story it will be. Sometimes I will start a story with just a character name or a scene and not know where it's going. Right. So, okay, so we have a bunch of names. We have an amount of names that we have. We can put in a few victims. We can put in a few red herrings. We have one occupation. We have a doctor. How about other occupations for some of these characters? Well, we don't know if he's a medical he's a doctor. researcher. He could be a veterinarian. A he could be a uh, just he a professor. Be, right. Yeah. The uh, scientist a researcher. of some kind. Okay. So what kind he of doctor also, is Dr. Lawrence Ming? He could also be the victim. He could be. Or the perpetrator because doctors have a certain a knowledge. Right. Although, don't we... Um, um, pick out the perpetrator last. <clears throat> it all it all depends. Sometimes uh, an idea will spark in somebody. They go, "What about if?" And they'll 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 take it off. So you never know which part of the things are going to set people off. Would you like to do the occupations next or the setting next? Because that will also determine a lot of how the story is going to go. Well, um, do we do we decide what roles some of the names would have, or, or do we decide their occupations? Absolutely. Occupations have, and the era. Sometimes the, the role will be the occupation, and sometimes the occupation will tell you the role. And the but era. Well, I mean, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. It's, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I interrupted you. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. I was just wanted to clarify by role. I mean, you know, victim, yep. slew. Red herring. <laughs> Standby. Sidekick. Sidekicks yeah, are very I'm important as well. Right. Yeah, I was thinking of, like, is this in history a little bit? Because the last one I did, it ended up sort of a Western type thing or, or a Can New be. Orleans thing. You're making the mystery. Tell us what you want to do with this. You've got all the sausage ingredients. <laughs> well, I'd like to, come, to be honest, I'd like to come up with the setting, and that might help us figure okay. out where what to do with these names. And, okay. But that may be just the way I operate. That's, Perfect. Okay. I mean, Susan and Sharon and Chris, do you have ideas for settings? Cruise ships, tropical jungles, deserts, historical, space, uh, New York City. Where, where would you like to see this mystery being set? The rural badlands. Oh, yeah. I like foreign that. countries. 
I know Coralie would love foreign countries because then she'd have an excuse to write another book. Especially when I know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen all of them. And it can even be something as specific as, you know, a farm, you know. Yeah. Uh, NASA. I think Chris wants a space novel. He loves the science fiction he, stuff. He, he was, oh, yeah, he was so. England for that. But it, it could also be at, say, the Kennedy Space Center. Right. So right. something can happen down there, something to do involved with a space launch as well, or something oh. with a space program. Ah, hot oh, on the Appalachian like Trail during a snowstorm. Yeah. Ooh. It's right near where I am. <laughs> 86 degrees out. So it's you're at the yeah. northern end. Well, I hope you're not having a snowstorm now. <laughs> I wish we were having a snowstorm now. <laughs> Elizabeth <laughs> Gaskell College, Pender's Cove, Green Cat Club. Wow, Ooh. very specific. <laughs> so Sharon is on a green kick. We have Howard Green Mudge and the Green Cat Club. <laughs> She's well, feeling very green today. Maybe family owned the... Um, and you can have more than one setting. Somebody Absolutely. Can on the Appalachian Trail, and it can be near Elizabeth Gaskell College. Absolutely. And uh, it like the. It sends people to NASA. NASA. And get around that, too. Velvet Banning and Lawrence Ming. I don't know if we picked who we picked, except it, they kind of remind you of the San Francisco during the gold rush. Now, uh, uh, a hut on the trail would be more insular. You'd have fewer characters. In a mystery, we want a certain amount, but we don't want to make it too insular with a lot of things. Uh, a place like the, uh, the college or the club, you have a lot of setting where people can come and go, a number of different characters and occupations mixing and mingling so that you have a lot of uh, leeway for coming up with interesting ideas. Anybody? A, a, a college... A college is always a good one because you get a re you can have a um, uh, a really interesting mix of um, types of people and yeah uh, yeah it's know. a good point yeah between faculty and staff students and I went to Berkeley so you could do a lot of things <laughs> and we have one doctor on our on our character list so a doctor could be certainly at a college a doctor yeah, right. of philosophy or anything else right. anybody feeling uh, feeling a spark there or something they'd like to put together. Well, I do like the idea of the college, and if Do Dr. Ming was our victim, there could be like a million reasons why people would want him dead. Maybe he's the president of the college. Okay. Ooh. And he's the victim. Yeah, so I'm thinking yeah. he's definitely the victim. Do we have a Velvet? Is she a student or a teacher? I, I want to say that Velvet is, despite her name, is something like, it, like the dean of some department or something. Okay. Hey, okay, that would be different. But sure. she's. But I don't she, know if I could go to a velvet. <laughs> well, that's the thing. She has to constantly fight against um, right. her. Right. To be taken seriously. But her yeah, parents. She looks the part, too. With well, her, her parents were hippies. <laughs> and Tall and perfect. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so is velvet women's studies, philosophy, something harder, a scientist? Uh, and like economist. For the NASA connection. Okay, let's oh, work with a NASA science. connection. Okay, yeah. Physics, you, you know, like how um, or mathematics. You probably know, like how Hedy Lamar was this brilliant. Um, yeah, physicist. everybody thought she was just a face, but she was brilliant. So Velvet can kind of be like that. She's maybe she's working on some secret research for NASA. Excellent. Okay. I, yeah. I was thinking some Apollo thirteen. Oh. The doctor discovered the thing about the Apollo thirteen. It was sort of sabotage. So there's a historical fiction aspect of it. Right. Okay. And s side note, speaking of Hedy Lamar, we have a great um, book here by, uh, um, uh, you know, of course, I blank on the name, but um, it's historical fiction about Hedy Lamar. She lives here in Concord. She's one of our local authors. But Excellent. Anyway. There was a great wow. documentary on her, too, uh, recently. Yeah. yeah, she's not <laughs> here. I know. Help, help develop the Bluetooth technology. Yes, she did. Yeah. Okay, so we uh, have we settled on a college as one of these settings then, for sure. I think that's a very good plan for, hey, hello there, Barbara. Okay, so Barbara, as you can see, we uh, would like to enter suggestions into the chat. Right now, we've gone through uh, character names. We could always use one or two more, and we're working on settings right now. Currently, we have a college as a setting. Uh, we can go with Elizabeth Gaskell. Or we can go with other colleges if the authors go, you know what, 
like Berkeley would be a great place for some or something closer to a space related uh, college? Well, I think that we need to make it a fake college, not a real okay. like, like um, although Berkeley is a fine place. Because you don't want to get sued? Well, Berkeley does have pretty much. Berkeley's had science. everything. They won the, they've got more Nobel Prize winners than anybody else. Right. More people get like messy when we start <laughs> killing people and having, you know, just, uh, we were, did have, you know, that in the seventies, we lost a lot of professors for some weird reason. They started dying. So were they killed? We did have a story like that when it was happening to the Russians. Because we well, had how about how about that Russians. for a plot line here? Doctor so Meng is one of the victims. So is this becoming a uh, nineteen early nineteen seventies historical fiction? That's up to y'all. Yeah, What's yeah, that's up interest? to you guys. I mean, you're talking more contemporary. I think. See, I was thinking. I liked the idea. I don't know if you want to go time slip, where it's in the in the current time, and then he mentioned uh, something tied to the Apollo thirteen. Right. Flashes back. That. And so then you could do the time slip where part of the book is in 68 and part of the book is in contemporary. Um, and that would give you your NASA tie. Um, not to make it too convoluted. Okay. Who's dealt with different timelines in their books and how difficult is that to uh, pull off? Well, it's difficult. In my second book, I did it... Um, because I had started writing a, a sequel to my first book, and then I started getting really interested in a prequel, and I'm like, oh, maybe I can just mash them together, and my publisher was like, no, 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 and I'm like, oh, it's going to be awesome. Um, the, the big issue is, and it's probably, we probably won't drill down that far today, is how much information are you going to give away from the earlier time you to not wreck the plot that's going right. on the in contemporary the current plot. time. Right. And what I ended up doing actually was writing the entire um, older part. I think they were about five years apart, writing the entire older part as one story, then writing the new one, then fitting the older one in, and then figuring out, I had to do this big outline, figuring out what I didn't want to be in the older one, but to be revealed later. And um, it was a lot of fun, um, but it's much more of a tightrope walk mm. than you would think, um, you know, because you, if something happened five years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago, it, but you still can't reveal, you know, the clues of that and right. that type of thing until they're relevant to the narrative you're telling. It's fun. It's fun. We could do that right now. Yes, absolutely. I, I think that's a great we idea. If you do that, because we don't have to write it. Excellent. <laughs> hey, who says? <laughs> yeah, you'll probably take it. Make it a short story. Uh, okay, so uh, where is this college going to be set? We have the idea of a college. So is it going to be set in the United States, Western, Central, Eastern, on the water, in the mountains, where, or a foreign country, the Sorbonne? I mean, uh, a NASA tie-in, so probably U.S. if you want, if that means something to anybody in particular. Uh, but where where in the U.S.? Because the setting can be a very important character here. Yes. So audience, give us some places where you think the college should be. Well, we have Elizabeth Gaskell. I don't even know where that is. I'm, I'm sorry. Is that up in Maine? I yeah, think I'm not, it's made up. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. Barbara's always got good ideas. Uh, come on, how about a where? Where would this college be, Barbara? I mean, up, she, she, made Sharon said she made it up. Okay. Yeah, where is she? Yeah, yeah. Come on, Sharon. You you gave us this idea. I'm Cove. Sure you, I do like that. I don't want to give the necessarily give the audience any any prompts. Prompting. I'm picturing it being on these like windy cliffs over the ocean somewhere. Santa so, Barbara. Okay, those those are good potentials because then you have. Sorry, I'm from California, so I talk. Then you have the people interacting with the setting, and then you have a lot of great detail that makes it interesting for people who know that area and place. I mean, Pinder's Cove to me sounds definitely Maine, and I think Maureen would love to to grab that one and go. Oh, I know, well, I know these coves. Um, only if it's on a lake, because I stay away from 
Oh. Coast of Maine, in my book. <laughs> Not a tourist fan. Okay, got it. International well, College of Data. Oh, of, of Cuba. Cuba. Wow, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. I know nothing about Cuba except the old cars. Excellent. You've certainly got some uh, a chance for some international espionage there with a NASA tie-in mm -hmm. and Cuba. So you have, you, you, this would be tending more along those lines if you wanted to pursue it towards a thriller. I, I am not comfortable with any kind of thriller or spy novel. I don't know about the other authors. How come? I'm not real well versed in it. I, well, I can't do thriller at all, but I'm, yeah. Um, Dale, did you say how come? Yeah, what makes a thriller different from the kind of things I, I that just, uh, you like? I just don't find them interesting. I like character-based um, char character based fiction. Not that thrillers can't be character-based, but I like um, the one of the aspects of the mysteries I really like is what in the human mind or psyche or emotions or whatever or in their interaction with other people are going to it will make them kill someone else. And when you have a thriller, generally um, the reasons are pretty clear cut. They're doing it because they want the secret formula or somebody's got a bomb or, you know, they want to take over the country or, and I know I'm oversimplifying it, but I feel like um, it, the, the motivations are less enigmatic. Well, that takes us to our next uh, series of audience suggestions, me. motivation. Okay, what is going to motivate a murder or murders in this mystery at a college with some connections, possibly to NASA, space, and international ties? So what's the motivation? Where is the meat of this story going to come from? Why is somebody going to do the unthinkable and kill someone else and risk everything to hide a secret, to keep it, to, to make financial gain for love, for jealousy. What's the motivation here for murder? Audience, let's, let's have some suggestions for what you'd like to see these, these, these authors work with. Make them work. <laughs> Sharon, Susan, Chris, Barbara, hello. There we go, competition, okay. Mm. That's always a good motive for murder. <laughs> Luckily, not among the sisters in crime, so. And, and when it's not the actual motive that it ends up being, it's always a great red herring, you know? Yes. Because you, you know, it's like, who would want this person dead? Especially, like, in a college setting. And mm -hmm. it's like, especially if they're competing for some kind of NASA thing. It's yep. like, wow. Who, lots of who puts a lot of red herrings in your work? Oh, I do. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, and that's why I liked the yeah. college concept is because there's the opportunity for so many of them, like you say, whether it's competition among other faculty members or is, you know, is somebody diddling on the side? Is there possibly, you know, or, or is uh, money up for grabs because there's a grant? Did somebody plagiarize? Did somebody steal? Yeah, there's a lot of possibilities in this kind of environment. Also, yeah. Nobel Prize is right. a huge competition yeah. for that. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and all the prizes, yeah. On that. All, and, all and the prizes, the, uh, the large grants as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah large and grants. Did, and did somebody t steal somebody's work to apply for the grant um, or the prize? Okay, right. so this is a good one. The victim discovered a visiting professor was collecting information to Ooh. sell to another country. Ooh. And they figured it was the Chinese man. And Sharon asks, is it safer for me to retire from WSU before someone did me in? Well, it's a yeah. possibility, Sharon. It's a definite maybe. Yeah. And and what I like is the plot where um where somebody stole someone else's work and killed the person before anyone else knew that they had created that work. Right. You know. But yeah, yeah exactly. somebody exactly. did know. Yeah. Good. Yep, stealing work. That's a, that's a good motivation for murder. Oh, and suppression of tenure. That's interesting. Ooh, suppression yeah. of tenure. So yeah. they're killing somebody who had, who was on the board, who had an influence in their future. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Excellent. Okay. And so if we <laughs> make the other characters, and we may need a few more names, if we have a bunch of professors and have several of these motivations in play, then you have a great mix of 
of red herrings and you know like what velvet was doing for nasa was so big that the that whoever our sleuth is thinks well it had to have something to do with that and then maybe the the actual motive um for maybe velvet actually she would have had to have some tie maybe she's having a fling with dr um ming um the victim but then it, it you know so the cops kind of key in on the whole nasa thing but yep. And I like the idea of Velvet working against type of being a very intelligent, very capable person, right. but also maybe some machinations going on or somehow involved this suppression of tenure under mysterious circumstances was granted could be blackmail. That's cause for blackmail. And that's always you a great You have motivation. to have some sex in it too. And she yep. was saying about Velvet. Well, if you want to sex it up, sure. Like, uh, you got to sell the book. Or Dr. Ming was interested in a relationship with Velvet, but she she wanted to focus on her work and was not interested at all. Mm -hmm. and, um, but she was being very professional about it. And so maybe not a lot of people knew. And that could either be another motivation or red herring as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a connection between Velvet and Dr. Ming. How about uh, Walter Wickham? Where is he going to come into this? Is he jealous? Is he a blackmailer? Is he another victim? A red herring? What's what's Walter's role in all this? Or he could be, you know, we need a cop or a sleuth. Okay, who's going to solve the crime? That's always a, a big one for mystery writers. Right. Who is the person that's going to engage the audience, be the, the the conscience of the audience, as it were, and speak for them and help to work their way, as the reader does, through this mystery to a solution. So you don't want them too smart. <laughs> you don't want them too dumb. Uh, you want them to be just right and maybe staying just behind or a little ahead of the reader. Well, well, how about if Walter is, um, is actually the head of campus security? Uh, just going to say that. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, that's good. And, and he has like a haunted past, like he was a cop and something happened. Yep. And oh, good. we also have the regular police working on the case, but Walter right. thinks it's... Yes, and they think he's below them. Right. Right. Conflict. Yes. Now, yes, he could be a black man and a gay man or something. Okay. Crazy. Right. And, and, and so he was set up on his police job and lost... The yes. Case. They um, didn't like him. Yes. Right. Oh, good, good, and, good. And, and so he landed as chief of campus security at Elizabeth Gaskell College on the lonely cliffs of um, Santa Barbara. <laughs> right. No, on the Cove. I thought we were going to make up another college. Pinder's Cove and Pinder's Cove. Yeah. Right. Okay. Pinder College. And well, it's a community not, college. Well, oh, we don't have that here, do we? They're called community colleges? Yeah. Yeah, we have those. Pin Pinder College. Did you call them junior colleges before, too? They're not called that anymore, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. In California, they aren't either. Okay. Okay, so we'll have Pinder College. So we have uh, Walter Wickham, head of security. We, we're not sure exactly what his character is going to be, but we've given him some great backstory to move forward. What is his reason for solving the crime, other than it's my job? What is his compelling reason? Well, that could be part of the reason if he was if he was unfairly drummed out of his job as a police investigator or something, he wants to prove himself and he knows that the police investigating this are going in the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah. redemption. He's, he's in it for redemption. Yes. A very important motivator for a sleuth because this is their life and they can move forward if they do something to solve this crime and make up for the sins of the past a little bit. Right? Yeah, absolutely. It's I, like me. I, because I'm creative, I don't fit into any other job. So I end up writing because that's the last thing I can do. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, killing well, everybody it's, else first. It's good that you can make a living at it because I, like you, don't either. <coughs> yeah, I actually have to work at jobs anyway. Oh, well, you're so good. I, I haven't been able to get a job except for those that hardly pay anything. Yeah. And they're not worth it if I'm writing. But. Well, technical writing is, is my day job, and that helps because you have to I think of an audience. I haven't been able to get into a technical writing job. Yeah, you have to think of an audience. You have to have work to deadline. You have to work with shifting yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, aspects and clues to put together. You have to be concise. You have to use an editorial eye, and you have to use desktop publishing tools. And you have to understand so the technology. It's, That's it's just like my job, only different. Yeah. 
Yeah, you you are a very people oriented. You're looking at people's motivations and how they act and how these actions come out in public and how the community views that person in that aspect. I mean, this is part of mystery too. Is what's that? <laughs> I said, in my job. Well, and if you're writing about things that are happening in Maine, all these I different work for a business publication. The business side of it. I mean, okay. I oh, I wrote business for... articles. Oh, that was so hard for EBSCO. I did the summaries, where I had to actually read business books. That was horrible. <laughs> I, no, I don't have to do that. I'm a. It's a still journal. Well, oh, you've got a real job. <laughs> I just tell to figure. It's always telling a story. I'm just. To between the seven of us or whatever, I'm just tired of working for bosses. I want to yeah. write for a living and Absolutely. not be your own boss. Yeah. Amen. The hardest one. You only have to deal with one jerk. That's what I say to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I know how to get around this jerk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Tell us how because we've yeah. all got monkey mind. But anyway, we digress. Okay, let's yeah, take right. uh, some of the other names here and fill in some of the other characters in this mystery. We've got a great start. We have a, a possible murder victim in Dr. Lawrence Ming. We have Velvet Banning, another professor at this college who was involved somehow deeply with this. We have a head of security that's going to investigate the crime. Chip Saunders. What is what is Chip Saunders going to do? He could be the investigator, the actual cop, you know, from... Yeah, that's a good cop name. Yeah. Good cop name, Chip Saunders. Okay. Regular cop. Because okay. it's first well, with, with saddle shoes, I think. Right. I'm sorry. I'm looking at Any loafers. Detail. His, <laughs> his, wear first, saddle shoes. his first name is something really horrific and embarrassing that his mother gave him. And so he calls himself Chip. And, right. and oh, then, but, okay. like but, in um, the security guy knows his real name. Good, good. And, and so calls him by it, right? Right, that's, exactly. That's a great opportunity for a lot of conflict between these two. If they don't really get along and yeah. they view each other with disrespect, and every time they clash on something, Chip has a chip on his shoulder. Exactly. That's a great uh, yeah. uh, solution exactly. from uh, Chris. So you've, you've already got a good setup for some conflict there. How about Howard Greenmudge? What is Howard going to be involved name. in all this? I love that name. Uh, is he another, another professor? professor? Is he, what, yeah. is, what is his role here? Yeah, he can be one of the other professors. That's a good idea. We need probably several professor names. Yeah, you're going to need either more victims or some bystanders, some sidekicks, or well, uh, you red need, herrings. You, yeah, you need red herrings um, and an actual killer, but you need a bunch of possible... Maybe Howard was, was you know, we've talked about the rival um, in, in academic stuff. Maybe Howard was Velvet's big rival for whatever okay. research they were doing for NASA. Who right. is the killer, by the way? Do we Chris have one yet? Admin at NASA. What? Do we have a killer yet? No, not yet. Um, yeah. so usually that's, um, you need all the other stuff, right? It all depends. Everybody put makes it differently. How do you work? What pieces do you put in at what time? Do you start with the idea for a plot? Do you start with a character? Do you start with a title, an idea? Yeah. How does everybody create their own mysteries? Well, I don't think of the kill. Well, I, I have a killer, but by the end of the book, it's not the killer anymore. <laughs> your yeah. killer changes in your books as you yeah, write. That's because interesting. it becomes too obvious, and I have to find somebody else. Who's okay. Obvious, maybe. How about everybody else, Linda and uh, Maureen? How do you uh, create? Well, put your I'm pieces an together? I'm an outliner, so I have absolutely everything in place before I even put pen to paper. And so, the very first thing I do is come up with my main protagonist. Um, and because I write in the 40s, I typically put them in a job that will allow them, interestingly enough, both these series end up with journalists. That, um, <laughs> weird, huh? I know, they didn't, uh, Teddy, I know, Teddy is a uh, photojournalist, and in my Under Fire series, Ruth is a uh, war correspondent. She's over in London. Um, but that lets them kind of squirrel around and, and find things. But I, I have all the characters' names, all their jobs, and who's going to get killed and when. Wow, that's great. And you, how about you? Uh, where I, mean, do you I think, think it would be make it easier to write the story, wouldn't you? 
<laughs> it sounds like it would. If you outline everything, you just follow, connect the dots, right? Right, right. I do a lot of outlining. I just keep changing my outline. Right. Uh, I, I outline as I go. I start out with, um, well, with my series, it's easier because, you know, I already had the characters and stuff. My first mm -hmm. book, I started out with kind of some plot things I wanted in there. There was a thing that happened in New Hampshire um, that I didn't like the resolution, the legal resolution for. And so I decided to twist that around um, to make it, it more to my liking and get rid of some of my anger about it. So I usually start with like some vague things. The um, the one I'm writing now started with, um, I had been at a craft fair at my town selling books with a couple other mystery writers. And then that night somebody in town had a Christmas party and I live in a small town. It's almost like some bad cozy mystery. Um, and people kept saying to me, oh, you're the writer. And I'm like, what if there were a writer in a town and all of a sudden there was this other mysterious writer who came to town to work on his book and everybody all of a sudden she wasn't the writer anymore even though people didn't know who this guy was they're like oh the writer he's working on it you know and and she feels a little miffed and tries to find out who this guy is oh jeez so that, that was partly huh? <laughs> yeah well that little seed was the start of what's now quite a uh, complicated um plot so what happens with me as I start with a few things I need to have the characters first um the main characters but people kind of come in but as far as a murderer goes um it's since I'm not quite sure how the plot will work out and not always sure exactly how the murder will work out I'm I'm not always sure who the murderer is, but one thing like people, like if, if there are people in my life, I won't say work, but think maybe work who bother me or irk me or who I feel some kind of dislike or resentment for. And people are always saying, oh, are you going to kill them off in a book? And I'm like, no, no, I make them the murderer because <laughs> they suffer more. Much more Right, the people killed are often victims, innocent or not. They're, um, yeah, and I want the this person to be the focus of dislike when somebody finishes the book. So um, that's usually <laughs> what I go by. Okay. <laughs> How about uh, so we need a killer? Uh, what about Barton Westbury? Would he be a killer? He could. Do do our does our audience have um, any more ideas for names? Because I think yeah, we... they threw out a bunch of them. So uh, we've used we've used most of them. We have we have roles for a lot of them. Yeah. So Barton Westbury, let's find a role for Barton. Well, and if he's the murderer, I what I'm seeing is the quintessential stereotypic cliched professor guy with a little bow tie and very fastidious and so nobody could even imagine this guy killing anyone because they Everybody, think he wouldn't have it in him he wouldn't he's right so they think he's like snamby pamby right and he, yeah so and what, Linda, what do you see his, his after all these things we've talked about what do you see his motivation um being oh wow oh. Blackmail, suppression of tenure, something to do with stealing secrets. Well, uh, I would think he sounds like he would just resent the living hell out of Velvet. Um, but hide up. Oh, let him do it by accident. Under his meek um, and mild. Uh, mm, I, I prefer it to be premeditated, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah me too. Uh, accidental seems like not enough planning for the reader and the, the and writer the reason premeditated is very strong reason to kill someone and strong emotions are what readers really like to see they want to see this conflict they want to see how a murderer thinks and plans and carries it out and tries to get away with it and maybe does or doesn't so that's that's a good thing so premeditated okay how about the murder weapon are we going to get to that now that we have a killer how is this meek, mild-mannered, unimaginative Burton Westbury going to off doc the doctor? And and obviously he wants to make it not look like he murdered her. So does he make it look like an accident? Does he make yes. it so look like... So if he's a like professor, he's professor of what? 
that would help in our deciding what he's going to do. Ethics. Yeah, although I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking he could strangle her with his bow tie. <laughs> oh, oh, that's an idea. Oh, no, don't hurt Velvet. No, let's let's kill off the doctor and but then that, leave Velvet alone. That would that would implicate him immediately in the. Well, it's just like a. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it's that's a, true. It would implicate him. He's well, the only one who wears one. Well, no, now let's I mean, be clever it, about it. Undo it when you undo it. Well, they would be all over it. Her, you know, or if he took it away, hers would. Yeah, true. So, how would someone kill someone, a prominent member at a college, while being on staff and being some sort of a suspect? You know, the police will interrogate you, and yet you want to throw suspicion off on someone else or make it look accidental. So, how is a highly intelligent person? going to try to get away with this. There's, there's else, the crux of this. A uh, letter opener. In an entertaining way. Or she takes a header off the cliffs and, and it's accident on purpose. Nobody or, was around. Who knows? Right. Who knows? Okay, cliff fall. Yeah, that's true because then you get, yep, then they've got to chase two lines of possibilities. Good. Yeah. And, and that's where the Chip and Walter can clash because each one thinks of it in a different way, views right. the clues. The policeman just wants to close the case and get on with things. And Walter goes, hey, hey, no, I think there's something going on here. Right. Chip thinks she was walking along in the dark or something and it's sure. an accident. He was called in because it was an unattended death just to see. And Are we Walter killing off Velvet? Yeah. Oh, you want to oh, kill Velvet? Oh, off me. Oh, oh, we did. Kill, no? kill the doctor. Kill Lawrence. Oh, oh, I forgot. All right. Sorry. Ming yeah. the Merciless. Kill off Ming the Merciless. That's right. Oh, wait, wait. We we have strangulation by stethoscope. <laughs> okay. If they find him down there, he's got some marks around his neck at the bottom of the cliff, but he's it's a steward. <laughs> That's a good one, I think. Well, Walter said that he these injuries are not consistent with falling off a 50-foot cliff. Right. Okay. Injuries around here. And that's so you, why Walter thinks... Yeah, although you can't have the cops be total morons. I hate when I see that. Yeah. Well, okay, so what would, what would cause Chip to not want to pursue this then? Does Chip have a deep, dark secret that is affected by all this? Well, there's, there could be pressure on him... The college, despite the fact that Dr. Ming is so important, um, the college does not want the publicity of having a murder committed. Okay, good. Yeah, so they just want the yeah they just want the cops to close it and find it accidental and move on. Good point. A lot of people don't understand that the police are under a lot of pressure to solve high publicity, high profile cases. Yes. So get it off their plate. They they tend to want to go down certain avenues, yeah. certain well worn avenues to try to close the books on things. Right. Whereas somebody so Chip else is the who, detective. What's that? Is Chip, Chip is the detective, detective and Walter okay. is the campus security person who is at odds with Chip, trying to uh get him to look more closely into this. Oh Chip, Chip, is Chip doesn't the want to. Yeah. Right, chips the cop, and so maybe because okay. the cops aren't morons and need to close it, <laughs> when it becomes obvious through through Dr. Ming's autopsy that he was strangled before he went off the cliff, Chip immediately keys on Velvet um, for whatever Good. reason, which we'll have to figure out with a writing, and it's the case of the cops, which happens all the time. Um, you know, keen on a suspect instead of going where the evidence takes them. And Walter knows is sure Velvet's going to do it. Okay, uh, ladies, we only have one Velvet in here and a lot of male voices. Let's have some female characters and what would they, what would their role be in this mystery? Think of a formal name for a professor, a female well, professor. And also, Walter could have an assistant. I don't know how campus security generally works, but usually, right yeah, there's several of them, at least in California. There, right. he could have a a young female. Young female, but a female professor. Um, very smart assistant who you know. You have to give her more 
Would she be a Kathy, a Kimberly, uh, an Amber? A good name. An audience. Do you have some name suggestions? Yeah, audience. Yes. Susan, Sharon, Barbara, you've got good names. Let's come up with some good ones. For a young assistant to the campus security who's maybe going to find some clues by herself, Eliza Stanovich. Go. Good. Right. Nice. And she went to, she didn't go to a fancy college like this. She went to a local. Goldie Bar. <laughs> Goldie Bar. Sounds like chocolate to me. <laughs> well, and, and so we also need, how about if we have a department secretary, whatever Dr. Ming's department is, and. Be yes, an official one. Goldie. Goldie and can be the secretary. Knows, How's that? She knows everything and anything and. Those yes. where the bodies are buried. And even has has a lot of uh, yeah things she has to say, opinions about things. Oh, good. So Goldie is a real character. She's got the name Goldie. And let me tell you, she has some opinions. Yeah. So she's yeah. a little bit of the comic relief, the, uh, the, the kind of sidekick character that adds color. When right. things are getting very tense or things are getting very dramatic, Goldie adds a little bit of Ah, here's a break in the action, and and yeah. readers would love to see somebody yeah. like her, you know, coming on stage, voicing her opinion, and adding a little pizzazz to the story. How's that? Right. Okay, right. here's one for the professor, uh, uh, older woman professor. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Ming's wife who only wants the truth. Good. And what's Ming's wife who only wants the truth's name? Before we get down to the professor there. Sure. Yeah, what's Ming's wife's name? Mrs. Ming. Yeah, what goes with Ming? Yes. Well, maybe she doesn't take the slave <laughs> name now. That's right. She could keep her maiden name, and that would be an interesting thing. Why did she keep her maiden name? Is there well, contention? Well, they having an affair, too. Yeah. Conflict there. Maybe she just doesn't. She Barbara just Stone Ming. Research. There you go. Nice. Barbara, how do you feel about that? Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it's very close. Yeah, yeah she's good. So she's she's not Chinese. Barbara Stone, right? Barbara Stone Ming, and yep, yeah, good. Okay, and Agatha Langdon. Do we want an Agatha Langdon in there? That uh, just a, another professor. Okay, Landon. But if we need her, we can add her. But sorry, that's one. For, oh, that's one for Corley. Agatha Landon, another professor. Good, because we don't want this just totally male oriented, do we? Yeah, but I mean, she's after all. nearly male. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, come on. Agatha is nearly male. Is nearly male, okay. <laughs> Barbara Barbara has given us the okay to use Barbara in the story, whether or not okay. she's a, she's a well, baddie or just a victim. It's a fairly common name. Well, she could be a red fish, Barbara Stone Ming. Now, authors, how cognizant are you of not using the same name uh, for different characters, or similar sounding names for different characters yeah. or confusing yes. the reader? And yeah, I see them when I'm reading it over. Yes, I changed names. It, it, it's very difficult. Um, you know, you don't even want them that begin with the same letter a lot of the time because people... I have, have a list of them. Yeah. yeah. And again, I'm so anal retentive. I put, I write the alphabet and then I list in... Yep. Yes, I did that too. <laughs> Yeah. So, so how do you come up with your names? Uh, do you, I uh, mean, uh, Maureen says she walks through cemeteries and that's a great way to get the local flavor for where you are of who has been there for a time and what are the, the standard names like Bruce Coffin in Portland is a mystery writer and he's got a great old New England name I mean the Coffin name is pure New England right from the start right. yeah. and, and uh, different parts of Maine have different you know yeah. different old you can go names. see county burials yeah when I when I, I where I come from it's all French Canadian names I mean there's Thibodeau's oh. Robichaux's well let's see Pariso, my name is Pariso my grandmother's name. In fact, I felt like um, when I was writing this book that there isn't enough of a nod to no Northern New England's French Canadian. That's true. Past. And so the book I'm writing, even though it takes place up here on Sebec Lake, um, has a very strong French Canadian aspect going through it because I've worked up my, I grew up in Augusta. Every town I've worked in in New England has had a very strong French Canadian background to the point where you hear, like when I lived in Manchester, New Hampshire, I would hear people speaking French every day. So, and it's there not are real French. French. <laughs> oh, oh wow, wow. Okay, my grandmother. There we go. Me that French. It is to them. 
but there's a lot of cool names like it in I just have to make sure I'm not like um like I love last names like Lamontaine and um Oh yeah, good singer too. Yeah. You know. I read a book once, I can't remember who the author was, where all the names were just these very bland kind of white bread names. Bob Jones. Right. And I remember <laughs> thinking to myself, who lives in a world where those are the names? Yeah. Some people have names like that, but most people, I mean, look at us and just the people on the screen here. Yep. You know? I'm from so many different places, but they're all European, which yep. makes me boring right there, I guess. Well, Chris, Chris has given us a comment uh, that, as a as a reader, similar names are a turn yes. off. Yeah. And I read one manuscript from a writer, and it was John, James, Jeff, Jack, and and Jody, all in the first like chapter. And I said I had to instruct him a little bit of how, what why that's bad. Right. Yeah. Don't create confusion. It's almost right. like a Russian novel. That's how I was taught. Oh God. Don't Everybody's make got it a Russian names. novel. Three name, three regular names, then their nickname, then their abbreviated name, and then there's a name by which they're known in the community. So yeah, yeah. That's I no longer have the capacity for that. Uh, right? uh, and I read a book that has to be simple with just a few names. Straight. And a lot of the mystery so book clubs. Are, so, so um, wh where were we? We are just about to go to audience suggestions for a weapon. So we oh. have the, you know, the motor murder, we have a stethoscope, we have falling off the cliff. What other types of weapons might they use in a college? Uh, we have possibilities of letter openers, antique letter openers. Right, uh, but there was no, I, did we determine he was strangled before he went over the cliff? That was a great idea. And I think if you want to run with that, go I ahead. I haven't gotten to that chapter yet, so. <laughs> but, I know, I know you outliners, I'm so sorry. I mean, this is not how we I'm do I'm a things. slow reader. <laughs> and, and, and was, if he was strangled before he went over the cliff, was he strangled with something that would implicate someone else who was not actually the murderer? Okay, so we have a couple of suggestions. Now go with it. So they fell off a cliff, but let's say they were killed as or before, just before they went off the cliff. So we have bookshelves falling and crushing the victim. That could certainly happen at a college. We have from Barbara a slow-acting mm -hmm. poison. So if it's poison and then thrown off, are they even going to bother checking for a poison if they see somebody fall off a cliff? I unless mean, if, there are, unless... Well, they always give it to the examiner, though. Some examiners are really not good as diligent as others. Not to find it. Well, well, don't some poisons have kind of an aroma or like with strychnine, they go into, you know, muscular... And some dissolve in the body after a certain time, too, and are very hard to detect as well. Sure. So how do you want this? So the poison would have to leave some obvious effect that right. the murderer didn't think of. That, right. the, that either the medical examiner would pick up on or, or Walter would pick up on. And one, of my books, and one of my books, somebody who looked like they died one way was actually killed by carbon monoxide poisoning. And yeah. she had the coloring of the... And and somebody saw that, you know, before it went away and said she died of carbon monoxide poisoning. Nobody believed him. We have a suggestion from Sharon. If they're talking about scientists, they have many poisonous materials, something even radioactive. Oh, yeah, that would be interesting. Oh, yeah. Especially yeah, and especially that, now we tie it back in with a space program. Uh, somebody was doing <laughs> research into that sort of thing. So we have radioactive elements introduced into this, causing radioactive poisoning, and to cover it up, Boom, push him off a cliff. You know, maybe they were well, like, well, this is odd, but you know. So so then we have to figure out, it, it's a writing thing, if we're gonna poison Dr. Ming. Poison or strangle Dr. Ming? Why, why throw him off the cliff? To throw off suspicion. Yes, and that's what <laughs> I was mentioning, a blue book in his mouth, but maybe they don't, oh, is it there? Yeah. I Maybe yeah, they don't use blue books anymore. For they don't? I know everybody uses laptops and just yeah. I was gonna say a blue book. <laughs> What's a blue book? No, I remember. I, are, I remember. But, you know, something to throw them off to think it's a student that's mad about his grade. Okay, so if it's Barton Westbury is the killer, Barton's pretty mild mannered. Would he be enraged enough to strangle him with a stethoscope, or would he be sly and subtle? Stethoscope. They're not medical doctors. 
okay, but that was one of the suggestions. We can we can say it's not really fitting in with what right. you've come up with for the right. setting, for the characters, and somehow that kind of weapon is less likely than others. So what about radioactive? Would would Barton be sly and you know put a put a slice of polonium in or something like that? Yeah, that sounds good. As as um as writers, this is where we would have to research what kind of poisons our yep. our professors would have access to. Here's the research rabbit hole. When Barbara says the poison could make Ming drowsy and Barton could push him over. You know, Barton's walking with him yeah. and having had him poisoned puts him in a weakened state and a very susceptible state. Bang. Right. So now you're covering up the crime and now Barton has to make sure that nobody knows he was out with Ming. Right, and, and that's another way that people don't think Barton could have done it, because Ming is a big, strong, tall, athletic guy, and good. Barton this little... Weak little... Guy. Good, good. So everybody's like, Dad, Dr. Ming, he plays basketball, even though he's in his 50s or whatever, you know, he's very athletic and strong, and uh, nobody's just going to overpower him and push him off. Really, they didn't have uh, fast Chinese basketball players, really, until recently. When and what was his name? Yao him. Ming. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's a relative. Okay. Yeah. Well, or they're they, not usually. Um, I, Barton could I give him long. I'm not sure. Maybe we shouldn't have like stereotypes of what someone um of that table idea. tennis. I think that would be too stereotypical. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, let's not go for caricature. I'm let's sorry. Caricature. I teach Chinese kids, so. He could be a Chinese American who plays basketball. He could be he could a power lifter. He could be. For, uh, maybe he's could Italian be. and his family shortens the name. <laughs> Ming's a no, Tony. He could be. We could make him something. Or he could just be a bodybuilder. Yeah, a power lifter. Yeah. yeah. There are plenty of men in their 40s and 50s who like to go out and play basketball every week of all sorts of ethnicities and backgrounds. Yeah, and if you've got a, a oh, six know. foot four very fit person and a and a five six foot, foot four, four very unfit Chinese person, man. people are gonna really Different. hard to believe that the larger person was overpowered somehow. Right. Oh well, I know, I know. We've got to make him big. Okay. So what other elements would you authors like to put into this mystery now that you have you have a lot of contention. So Velvet's got a role. We haven't quite defined it. She she must have a secret, a secret relationship with a married man, uh, a secret of the work involvement, a uh, secret of she knows somebody was selling secrets to another country, or she knows about some sabotage, or some dirty thing involved and money in involved, or power. Because Velvet's a suspect, right? Velvet's going to be a big suspect. I mean, of course oh, they go, oh. All right, don't describe her like that. <laughs> How about Barton, Barton plants something or on uh, Dr. Ming to make it look like Velvet might have had something to Good. do. Good. Stick something in his pocket before he pushes him over or something that would be, um, or, you know, he he somehow gets Dr. Ming's phone before he pushes and and makes it look like he texted Velvet, you know, something that would. Handkerchief in the pocket with perfume on it. Cause could say she wears a distinctive perfume does she absolutely uh, velvet of course she wears a distinctive perfume right yeah <laughs> she wears aqua velvet oh, oh God. <laughs> okay linda we're gonna mute you now <laughs> chris just <laughs> wow uh, sorry oh, oh, here we go uh, here's one from chris uh, oh actually from sharon yang my husband has uncles who are six feet or in that vicinity so yes the the stereotypical that Asians are all short is really no, wrong. I'm not saying stupid. short. Six feet yep. is normal. Excuse me? <laughs> well, I think we've moved on um, beyond the racial stereotyping. Yeah, to and pieces. copper sulfate is used in the, from Chris, copper sulfate is used in the space program. I'm just toxic saying what readers say and to me. High doses. That doesn't um, look real. Where would you get copper sulfate? Okay, Chris, you do you, a professor. there's the research rabbit hole right there that writers have to go down. We come up with a cool idea, and now we have to find out how would someone have access to that? Could they easily get it? How would they hide the fact that they've Copper gotten it? Copper sulfate is what? A copper sulfate. Or is it for the... 
it's used, it says it's used in the space program and toxic if swallowed in high doses. And also, how, how, when somebody uh, comes out of Nevada or Utah, if it's toxic in high doses, how does Barton get Dr. Ming to ingest it? Right. I mean, if I, it's, so. I can't imagine it tastes very good. Right. Okay, here's Barbara's suggestion. Barton secretly loves velvet, oh. and Ming has velvet's secret, and read, which he's ready to make public. Ooh. And Velvet wants to silence Ming, so she cozies up to Barton to get rid of him. Do people like that? Oh, oh the femme fatale. Is yeah. Velvet, yeah, is Velvet femme Having fatale? Is sure she were. victim? What's her role here? Is it complicated? Okay, Linda, you can talk again. I know. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm looking up copper sulfate. <laughs> <laughs> this is what writers do. It's like, I'm in the middle of writing a story. Wait, I have to spend the next day and a half researching what yep. and how type of caliber the gun was used in 1873 out of exactly. that particular time and place. Oh, my gosh. You'll be happy to know it's soluble in water. So there you go. And I, I'd say Martin has made it in his, as whiskey. Dr. Ming has uh, loves fine food and drink. And Barton has offered him something, uh, a bottle of port, a whiskey, a, a recipe. A bottle of aged whatever, 55 Bottle of aged whatever. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Well, and um, it is also used as an herbicide in agricultural settings. So maybe one of our professors is, you know, the botany oh, professor. <laughs> so the botany professor can Green get Green whatever his name was. Yeah. Green much, Maybe. green much, Maybe green much. Velvet, Velvet had a had um, a relationship a while back with a professor in the agricultural school who wasn't happy that they broke up, and that so there's another red herring, and he right. would have access to copper. How about green right. much as the agricultural? So that's even yeah. that even puts the in the reader's mind. Oh, green much. Okay, so right, I get right. green much yeah. agricultural. And then that works in because we'd said that he might be her rival, but yes, with a as a former lover with a grudge, boom, there's a perfect red herring to throw right in yeah, there. Absolutely. Nice. We are getting towards the time when uh, the, we might leave the audience to just ask questions about what they know of, but of course, you're all experienced writers. I don't know if you have any questions. Would you like to see? Well, maybe they have some suggestions yeah. that they'd like to speak about instead of chatting. Build That's what Barbara yeah. Do you want more suggestions? Do you want to chat with the authors? How would you like to proceed, audience? Susan, Sharon, Barbara, Chris. If, if they have something they want to add to our process here. Yeah. What, would you like to add to the mystery or it? find out more about making uh, a mystery from what you've seen here? You want me to turn everybody's? Uh, yeah, let's do that. All right. We have, we have enough people that we can do that with. Because I think we've got a great start to making a mystery right here with uh, a list of suspects. We have a, a fun setting. Uh, we certainly have a lot of secrets and potential for making great conflicts and great choices in how this mystery is going to proceed from place to place. Good chances to, to salt clues in there, to put some red herrings, to put the police and the investigator off on false trails. Uh, you've got enough people in there to make it worthwhile and have enough characters to get the reader interested without getting confused as to who's who. So I think that's a great start. Thank you for all the suggestions, everyone. Yeah, this is, this is a great premise. This is fabulous. Who, who's going to take this and write it? <laughs> yeah, I'll come up with right another now. one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you'll probably do I have it. To take it back 70 years, but yeah. You know. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Hello, Susan, and Sharon's Hi. coming on. And there's Barbara. Okay. Yeah, thank you for all the suggestions. Those are great. I mean, we got a lot of fun stuff. Of course, it helps when people are experienced mystery writers because they come up with really good stuff to, to throw in and say, well, this would make a fun ingredient in the sausage. Let's let's put that in. That's gonna spice it up some. I'll eat the sausage, okay? You guys <laughs> put it together. I'm very hungry every time you. You have to write the sausage. That's the deal. <laughs> one, one thing though that these doing these always makes me realize is I could never write a book with someone else. Have any of you, even mm. in the audience, collaborated on a mystery novel with someone else? Ooh, no. That's good. Has anyone done that? No. Or what? No. Asked me to. I'm like, I, I, I realized a while ago after working on some other projects that I can't be in a band. I'm a solo act. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The music has to be mine. It's just can't be tempered with someone else because you're like, no, no, that's the yeah. wrong note. 
Yeah. I don't know I how you could get two voices to get. You know, everybody has his or her own voice as an author. I, I don't know how people can. Well, Charles Todd does it with his mother. I was just yeah. going to mention yeah. Charles Todd. I know. Todd. I, that. I hate reading all those books right now. I can't stop reading them, and yet I have so many issues with the writing. <laughs> and, and I keep telling myself, are the issues because you have two people doing it? Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And Nathan Stephen King has collaborated with other people, and he has a very distinctive voice. He's collaborated with Peter Straub and others, um, and his sons on putting books together. But with, they might have some process, you know. Yeah, like sometimes you'll write one there, chapter, and somebody will write another chapter, and then and then weave them together. But man, um, I wow, that's that's a tough gig. Yeah, I think it would be as two adults. I have a friend who is writing some YA fiction with her uh, high school aged daughter. And it's working because the daughter is able to give voice to the teenagers, and my friend is giving the voice to the adults. And um, but she said it was challenging. It was very oh. challenging. There were two women in the '90s who collaborated on writing um, mysteries set in the Boston finance world, oh. and um, I don't know what happened to them. But both of their, I think both of their names were on the title page. Um, but they were friends, and one was a writer, and one was in finance. Mm. Oh, that's a good idea, then. Yeah. And that, that gets what, complicated. And Hallie, Hallie Efron collaborated with a oh, psychiatrist, that, yeah. psychologist, for her first series. That's right. I have written books for other people, but then they didn't accept it because they wanted to go their own route. You know, they think they're writers. You know, I made it to sell, and they didn't like that. Maureen, are you having uh, technical issues? Right. I'm not having any, but I'm hearing other people seem to be having them. Okay, yeah, you, you kind of faded out there for a minute. I did? Oh, I did? No, Maureen did, yeah. I think, Barbara, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, I <laughs> wanted to give a little uh, sideline to uh, Ming's wife that she would find something that would make a little suspect of something. Oh, absolutely. We have to throw suspicion off. Yeah. The, uh, find something that would trigger her to think, wow, what's, what's velvet? Well, no, or something. Yeah. Right. And we add layers of Everybody complexity. And by out. adding these, these clues, these real clues, these fake clues, these totally misleading, you want the reader misled a little bit, don't you? and say, oh, I see now what you were, oh yeah. You love that moment of aha, that surprise, that epiphany that the reader has when everything comes together and they figure it out just maybe a little ahead of the sleuth. And the readers love to get that. And that makes for a very satisfying mystery when everything works together, the puzzle has, has fit, and they go, that's a satisfying ending. That's, I love the resolution. I love how the characters ended up and maybe justice was served or was it was it not served you have different types of mysteries for that and i think sharon you also like the historical oh yeah i i'm kind of with linda would have to move it back 70 years if i would <laughs> yeah, barbara yours are contemporary right yeah no they're historical i do alternating chapters between time yeah. periods oh so good I, okay because we had talked I'm about that earlier on but, yeah. how hard it is to loop a, another timeline into a main story. And if well, you're mine aren't doing... really mysteries. They're more suspense. Okay. Because you know who my bad guy is, you don't know what they're going to do. Oh. And how. Hmm. So I have a hard time writing an actual mystery per se. Hmm. <laughs> but you just Susan, don't know how about you? That much between yeah. a suspense and a mystery. What is the difference? Well, in a, I, I believe in a mystery, you don't know who the bad people are. You put oh, those. Oh, I see. And you are like. Uh, yeah, Higgins, in suspense, did you really do know who the bad people okay. are. You don't Higgins know did one of those. That they're taking and throw in different things that confuse you or whatever. So, yeah, okay. interesting. So, how does everybody feel about creating a, a mystery in just a just over an hour with it's suggestions fun. with writing prompts? Yeah, I like it. It was fun. Yeah, fun. Because yeah, I do like being creative. When brainstorming is always creative. fun. You know, people yeah, always say, to... where do you come up with ideas? I go, ideas are the easiest thing in the world. It's yeah. sitting down and making a uh, yeah. yeah. hundred pages out of one of them, you know, yeah. 80,000 yeah. words sure have enough... that matter. Yeah. 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 And are sellable. Subplot. Yeah. 
<laughs> What's your subplots? You have to create subplots. Subplot. We didn't even talk about subplots. Yeah, but, they all but have here... to tie together at the end. You have to tie right. everything yeah. together. Yeah. What I like to do is leave one or two ends not completely tied up. People have an idea of what happened, but mm -hmm. just as in life, we're not really 100% positive, and that's not quite perfectly solved. And I love to leave that little bit of mm -hmm. uncertainty in there. Instead of just, I don't like everything just wrapped up neatly and put on the table as a Christmas present and go, oh, it's all perfect, because life is messy. <laughs> so I write messier stuff. These people right now, all the really stuff messy. The living room is messy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> yes, but you see, you see, everybody who signed on has bookcases in the back to show us what readers they are, and that's great. <laughs> I'm at a B and B, so I'm. I have the wall of the B and B. Yeah, sometimes they have a they, they have a shelf though of uh, yeah, leave a book, take a book, that kind of thing. So I'm not so lucky. <laughs> so I put fake backs. Back <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. You know, we're all book lovers, mm -hmm. and so you know, to our audience, we will say, since Chris is on here, please, if you're gonna purchase books if any of these authors interest you and the things they've come up with the types of mysteries I, which i think a lot of them are in areas that you seem to have an interest in get them from a local independent bookstore yeah. preferably free thinkers corner yeah. because the local business can use the money a lot more yeah. than jeff bezos can and i'd like to add too that chris um you give chris all the credit in the world for realizing the importance of bookstores and starting one and keeping one going during the yeah. pandemic um yeah. you know we need yeah. that we need bookstores and i yeah. get yeah. give all the credit in the world for that. and he's trying to oh, make it you. more than just a bookstore he wants a community yeah. center That's in that nice. area i mean they took over the building next door he yeah. really wants to expand and make it oh, something cool. even more like an arts and cultural center oh, cool. yeah we started cool. to do Are that to uh, food we that in order to serve drinks we have to serve food oh you're gonna serve drinks oh that's even yeah that was here. Well, one of us knows. Get them yeah. liquored up and get them buying. <laughs> one one part of our our business model was all it was local local authors local yeah. arts local um, wines and beers being able to sell those mm. and um, so we ended up we got our our license to sell bottles of wine to take off premise and drink at home or wherever just not here. We can't do beer because we have to be more like a grocery store. We have to have huh. 500 different kinds of consumable items, including meats and cheese. And yeah, I know. It's, that's going to be my next episode <laughs> in a couple of years is to see about getting those things changed. But anyways, for now, we do have uh, a couple of local vineyards here and uh, meads, a couple of meaderies, meaderies here that people can buy. So in January, we started, we rented, um, the space next door, which is a gallery, which was a gallery. And um, so we're going to keep it a gallery. We're going to put our coffee over there because we had it over on the store side. We're putting it over that side. And we're going to increase our license to be able to um, pour beer and wine over there because we have, we're allowed to do um, tastings during some of our events. So paint nights and poetry nights, things like that, author events, we would pair that with a local brewery or vineyard but I'd like to be able to pour at the same time. Mm -hmm. So somebody who sits down to paint can say, oh, that tastes good, but I'll have a glass of that. Problem with that is we have to serve food. We have to prepare food. We can't just have, you know, low pastries or, yeah, something <laughs> like that. We actually have to prepare Oh, no, they do better than that in New Hampshire. <laughs> What's that? You do better than that, don't you, in New Hampshire? Well, um, Not just I have donuts. to. So I have to come up with a menu um, and so I'm working with the person, the, the officer who handles, from the liquor commission who handles this area, um, limited menu, because I didn't want to go there. Coffee, pastries, you know, it's things I didn't have to make. That was the most I wanted to go as far as, as far as food goes. But I'm thinking like maybe little, little tiny salad bowls or um, a panini press. That seems to be one of the popular things to do. Um, get, yeah, something like that. Uh, a cheese and hummus plate cheese, or yeah, vegetable plate, something like that. Um, Farmer's platter, yeah. Yeah, maybe some little pizzas, something that I can, you know, just put together real quick oh, and throw in. <laughs> yeah, so. now we're talking about food again. Okay. So Chris, yeah. give us again the name of your store and its address for those who may be watching this recording. 
Uh, the name of the store is A Free Thinker's Corner. Well, it's kind of nice. backwards, but nice. um, A Free Thinker's Corner. Uh, we do have shirts for sale, not this particular one, but we has a brand new design. Good, I like um, the ones. <laughs> the, the, the front design is the same, but we did put a back design on it where if you go um, on our website, our logo is the thinker with a book behind him. Oh, nice. And so uh, that's on the back. And then the, the saying, um, I think, therefore, I'm... I think, therefore, I'm dangerous. Mm -hmm. I like this. Address and website. Ah. Chris, do you, uh, address and website. The address is 652 Central Ave, Dover, New Hampshire. And the website is www.freethinkerscorner.com. I was going to ask you, what's your opinion about the, uh, it's, it's called bookshop.com, where, where bookstores get on and they sign in and yep. then they get proceeds from the books. You can buy yep. from them. And then have it, you know, is that a good thing for you or not? It's bookshop.org and it was, oh, yeah. it's been fantastic through okay, this good, good. Uh, pandemic thing. We joined way back in January um, and uh, before everything really got started, but they, um, they've they really stepped up and helped us a lot. Uh, so say a $26 book, we'll get seven eighty dollars out of that okay. as, as a commission. As I long know. as they go through, as long as you go through the link on our store, right. that portion, well, Actually, no, yeah, that portion comes back to us. But then there's a general pot, too, that 10% goes into for bookstores um, from, like, other affiliates, like the New York Times. You buy a book or something through the New York Times. Uh, 10% of that sale goes to a general pot for all bookstores that are associated with them or signed on with them. I think, so I think we, just got, we just got their six-month payout for that. There's like 800, I think 840 stores connected to them. And it was a significant amount Good. that came back to us. Now, if you go on the bookshop.org and select your, your shop, then you will still get it, correct? You don't have yes. to go? Okay, yes. that's what I thought. All yeah. Right. yeah, if you don't select a bookstore, 10% of the purchase still, though, goes into goes that into main pot that you okay. see. Um, yeah, it's really going big, I think, that particular site. Well, it has. So, authors, let's hold up your latest so the Oops. Susan and Sharon and Barbara can go, oh, I want that one. So, Linda's showing her latest okay. right behind her. I, I never okay. remembered her point. Yes, sir. Maybe it's a light. Carly Lakes to die for. Oh, oh yeah. Secret. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Backwards. No, oh, it's it. backwards. It. Sure. Oh, it's secret. Yeah. Maureen, what, what about yours? I think she's frozen out. Oh, she's like, frozen oh. out. Oh, oh, there, there she is. is. Yes, yes, there doing is. it all along. <laughs> <laughs> Maine. <laughs> I'm having my my, uh, my fifth one's, fourth one's coming out in the fall. Right? Excellent. And Chris in Dover is perfectly situated between Maureen and us down here in Massachusetts. <laughs> so he's yep. halfway between, so you don't have to try very far. <laughs> and I'm definitely looking forward to all of this being over so that we can have you all yes. here in oh. person. Boy, because yeah. the big thing we were gonna do, the big thing we were gonna do with the gallery was have multi-author events in there. Mm -hmm. We had one the end of March, and then we shut down two days later for good. I was good. so looking forward to coming in there and doing yeah. a great big event yeah. there. Oh, it went pretty, it went pretty well. So, and mm -hmm. I had booked uh, three more for May, June, and August, and they all had to be, of course, canceled. But I got one in, and I know it works, and it'll work again once we can good. doing it. Good. Awesome. The only trouble is, is that being isolated and having to stay in your house and potentially get bored is great for writers because now we're like, damn, I have no more excuses. Now I have to get that book done. <laughs> yeah, I, I, actually, I actually got the call. I've been on furlough and I got a call um, Friday that they give me a return to work date. And I'm like, uh, but no! I'm not quite done with my manuscript. <laughs> Let me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> I had to turn oh. down my substitute job. Because the kids love to hug me. Uh, yeah, I'm too old. Yeah, I know. Thanks. Everybody's yeah. everybody's at risk. I mean, yes, yeah. 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 Thankfully, we had everything. We started online yeah. before we yeah. opened our doors. So we had oh, the yeah. website going. We had the web store going yeah. and everything. So I had taken when we opened the doors. I took all our used books off and just kept all the new books and our local authors on there. So yeah. as soon as we had to lock the doors, everything was ready to go. I just had to oh, update a few that I hadn't Good. put up there. And of course, all the daily changes and stuff with policies and procedures. But other than that, we were ready to go. And 
in three months, we tripled our online sales from the first year and a half, or I'm sorry, the first two and a half years, two years that we had the website. We've had the website up for two and a half years. And in three months, we, in just three months, we tripled the sales in that first whole period. Excellent. So that's good. We've done better than expected, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Um, So now, Chris, hey. you will send us the recording of this, the uh, link to that, yes, so that everybody can put that on a social media and get that yeah. out and drive more yeah. traffic both yeah. to your own site and yeah. to Free Thinkers sure. and to Sisters in Crime. Sure. Yeah. So, Susan and Barbara and Sharon, thank you very much for coming oh, on and great. helping out with this. Yeah, well, I yeah, forgot. It's such a nice day. I time. Kind of forgot. Final yeah, comments from anyone? It was fun. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. I hope I didn't interrupt too much. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, thanks, Dave. Uh, very collaborative. Well, well done. Okay. Well done. We'll see y'all. We'll have some more of these. Great. Thank you so Bye. much, Chris. Bye. Bye. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, panel. There you go.